Nomad, Chapter 1, Part 1 My phone flashes to life with a jarring hum and a message from a man whose current concerns are of none to me. Concern, that is. The block of glass and metal is promptly locked and stashed away by hands not quite at rest in their respective pockets. Mm. It's cold. Muttering the phrase almost comes as a surprise to myself, but to my immense relief, none of the people on the train platform turn around in wonder of what strange being just noted the temperature to itself out loud. Without audience as it may be, the action is made even sillier by the fact that in the truest of ways, it is cold. Some undefined external thing. Having just left a heated carriage, my clothes are still suffused with stale, warm air. So it is only breathing that alerts to the notion that other things, out there not me things, might be cold. Thick, opaque, and with a slight glimmer as though crystals of ice were forming within it the moment it escapes my mouth, the clouds billow forth and with them a chuckle. The realization of just how much this place is not me, how small and free I am within it, tentatively makes its way across a mental landscape utterly unaccustomed to and unprepared for such notions. Only another odd, faceless entity laughing to itself outside a train station. Another person. Taking in the deep comfort of this idea along with another lungful of the crisp autumn night reveals with burning satisfaction just how cold this marvellous alien city is and at once a passionate desire for the chill to permeate coat and shirt, to absorb me into it as a newborn stranger, to wash away the stuffy, tepid cabin gases for the sake of belonging, clean and without baggage, takes hold. A five-dollar bill is unceremoniously stuffed down the cup a homeless man is holding, his face only registered as much as the action itself, which is to say barely at all, before I properly exit the station. Deep hanging clouds make the visibility somewhat poor, but it suffices to reaffirm already known information. There is not much of a skyline to behold in Ruston, or at least none which is impressive at all to someone with prior experiences of such. If one were to lower their standards now, it might be said that there is a lack of absence of skyline. Most buildings are certainly a few stories higher than I'm accustomed to, and so the sheer amount of humanity does elicit some sense of pensive awe. The clouds are tinged red, with the last vestiges of a setting sun still barely visible above the horizon as the city falls into twilight. Further inspection reveals a more well-lit area up ahead, which must be the city centre, I conclude, not quite familiar enough to say for sure, but making my languid way towards the light regardless. I am in no particular rush to arrive at my destination. I am in no particular rush to arrive at a place. I don't know why I fear getting to the apartment I have chosen as my goal, or getting there now, or getting there like this, whatever any of these are even supposed to mean. I merely know that I fear, and have begun to fear recently, and without noticing. A stranger as I may be, I am in no way one to fear, or even to fear of unknown origin, for that matter, and with all experience comes a carefully honed response. A chess piece, moved in a familiar way, is countered with a familiar move in return. Focusing on the physical symptoms, numb extremities, racing heartbeat, unsteady gait, desire to throw up into a nearby garbage can before crawling into it. These are things which can be seen as just happening to oneself without cause. Things to get annoyed by, things to curse one's body over, sensations to distract from thinking about their cause until they are things in themselves, rather than the result of any specific thought, to be considered and found deeply unpleasant. To stick with the chess metaphor, I consider this the emotional equivalent of castling, which is to say that it is always a good move and should be done whenever one is given the opportunity. Descending towards the city centre reveals that these roads are old, not badly maintained, but forking, ending and turning, at no point granting straight view ahead at the destination, now that my, in more ways than one, staggering progress has cost me the advantage of altitude. Considering it a bit more, I think I prefer it that way. The rigid grid structure of more modern cities might be convenient, but it also feels exposed, like a place one could fall out of, the way one can with smaller towns. In a way, the buildings enveloping me, as they do here, is comfortable. Excuse me. My fingers pointed at my own chest, and the universally understood I am incredulous at the idea that I might be addressed, despite that obviously being the case, gesture. It's the middle of the night, and this is a residential area. No one's around. Of course he means me. Yeah, you happen to know where the station is? 
The finger previously aimed at my person now points over my shoulder in a way that I only realized too late might just look a bit silly. Oh, oh just up there. Ten minutes or so, maybe. Oh, good, good. Been astray in the cold for too long, you know? It is quite frigid. Hmm. There's something odd about the way he looks at me, uncomfortably appraising with his sharp brown eyes, but also sad in a way. Kind but oppressive. Rather than leave it as a superficial remark about the weather and go, he just stands there, staring. And I cannot bring myself to avert my eyes or carry on my way because of an inscrutable feeling that doing so would negatively impact his assessment of my person. So I continue returning his gaze, taking in the scraggly beard, the pronounced cheekbones, the wrinkles on his forehead. Early forties, definitely. Maybe... You smoke, kid? I don't. Not out of some moral opposition or regard for my physical health. It just has never been a thing I did. And yet... Um, yeah. Showing what might be the hint of a smile, the stranger produces a cigarette from his coat and hands it to me. Thanks. Safe travels. It's a platitude, but something in his pause and way of navigating the syllables endows it with an almost intimate sincerity the phrase doesn't rightfully deserve. Always envied people who can speak like that, like some radio personalities whose greetings can bring a smile to your lips like those of a close friend. I've only ever been able to do the opposite, make the heart felt sound jejune and shallow. With that he leaves and surrenders me to the night again, with nothing but a suitcase and a cigarette. Unequipped to light the thing, I just twirl it between my fingers with the sort of dazed fascination this mundane artifact clearly warrants. The scent of tobacco is barely detectable in the cold. Not a pleasant smell, as far as I remember, but always kind of homely, like old fabric, yellowed and stuffy, things the great temporal current simply passed by, but which aged nonetheless, stuck and comfortably uncomfortable, until the day they realized that everything around them had eroded, that the place in the world did not exist anymore and that they didn't meaningfully withstand the current, that there was a very crucial distinction between withstanding and standing by. You're harvested, you age, and then one day you are set aflame. As with people, as with old furniture, as with cigarettes. I think I will prefer the scent once it is lit. That's probably why I took it. As the meditation on grandfatherly sofas and cancerous inhalants draws to a close, the tip of the television tower gradually emerges behind a building. From there it should only be a few minutes to... Didn't I want to explore? Didn't I want to not go there? Why was I just blindly walking towards the one area of the town I know? The place where you find your destiny won't be around a familiar corner, as it were, so why am I here? I turn the spot and walk left, choosing the lateral move of a simple regression that would only render the past few minutes of walking a waste. It's not often that I lose sight of my impulse towards self-sabotage, but the feeling of betrayal is no less gut-wrenching for it. An emotion cutting bone deep is not much of an accomplishment, considering my skeletal state of frame, and yet, just that fact might cut a good bit deeper, how shallow all the things that hurt me are. I don't fail to notice my hand clutching the phone in my pocket a little tighter, and I am momentarily tempted to throw the piece of blameless tech against a wall before reconsidering and loosening my grip. Perhaps the cell phone tower has already vanished in the distance behind me. I resist the urge to look back and fear that I might re-establish a sense for my geographic position, and am temporarily reminded of a thing the flame used to say when high. To feel is to feel lost, always and from the start. I could never quite bring myself to agree, but then again, maybe I never allowed myself to be lost enough to feel. Branching out from the centre, the architecture loses purposefulness. Things no longer appear as though they were placed in service of cohesion, and more like they were just built because there was space making use of the gaps in what already was. I guess that's our city's form, adding on at the periphery, never quite fitting perfectly, degradation increasing with each layer until you reach white noise. With real cities, at least. If you plan the whole complex, plan for it to be a city, then it can just expand as though building of Lego bricks, following the despotic auto-governing pattern of self-similarity. Synecdoche, forever negating any real liminality, but that feels insincere in a way. There is something, a certain very human quality to a settlement growing despite expectations, perfectly exemplified in a town encasing its own city walls within itself. 
redefining their function, reincorporating them, no longer fortification but landmark, perhaps even art. It leaves room for people inhabiting it despite expectations. There's a real warmth to the idea that anything has a place, any degradation is already accommodated since conceptomic decay is the modus operandi. Every broken bottle, every graffitied wall, every abandoned building is an invitation to the ill-fitting to badly fit beside them and make a new hole. Like this bridge. My line of flight seems to have taken me far enough out from Rustin's core that street lights are necessary for illumination, since display windows and other inside lighting has ceased to suffice. The dirty orange casts its beam across a roughly hewn stone bridge over a charming canal, though canal might be going a bit far, as able-bodied folks could easily jump across what meager current passes below the arch. By no means am I far enough out for something so rural to fit in, and the city apparently agrees, shielding itself from the anachronistic rocks with layers and layers of neon spray paint, symbols and names and pictures covering and intertwining so that the result can't rightly be called either. More than colours, less than meaning. Or maybe not. If the words were legible, they would likely make far less sense than they do painted over and repurposed as they are. The way the verisimilitude of an ancient tablet is diminished if one can read it. Perfectly reasonable as gibberish, but always somewhat false feeling when understood. Was it really like that? Did people talk this way? Makes me glad to have forgotten Latin. Though maybe that's an excuse. I don't regret it at least. Perhaps then meaning can be meaning without one being able to put their finger on it, or to disentangle the images from each other and the bridge. What might be a raised digit flowing into either a barely recognizable signature or a vine of sorts even dares to suggest that one's finger is of more use somewhere else entirely. My chuckle is reflected by the underside of the bridge to sound slightly fuller, and I can't help but interpret that as an agreement. It feels like a question, a strange sort of Rorschach test perhaps, where the answer for once isn't moth, but all of the above and more underneath. Hey, you got a phone?